So first of all, welcome to today's session. Um, I understand our position here on stage. It's us against your lunch. So we try to make this as interactive as possible. Um, we um, would like to present you. We don't want to sell you anything. We don't want to convince you of anything. We just want to show you our journey into OpenStack over the last two and a half to three years. And um, without any further delay, um, I would like to introduce my co-speaker, Ralph Dehner. Hi. My name is Klaus Henning Kapell. I'm a senior program manager at SAP. Together with um, our implementation partner, B1, um, we went on a fantastic journey over the last two years to make a strong move into OpenStack, and um, we would like to present this today to you. Again, we'd like to make this as interactive as possible. If you have any questions, please interrupt us at any time. Um, at the end of the session, we try to keep another five minutes for, for questions. Before we, get, before we begin, um, about three months ago, you might have seen that SAP has released uh, a press release that um, SAP um, has committed to Cloud Foundry and OpenStack. Uh, we are very proud of this. Um, after we've worked hard for two years internally to bring OpenStack live, to bring it into production, to make a volume rollout, um, we have been able to convince a couple of other people within the company that this is a good project to work on. And uh, we are very happy that SAP, along with a bunch of other partners, are supporting OpenStack. We've set up a short again agenda for you for the next 30 minutes. We'd like to speak a little bit about both our companies, what we do, how we do it. Um, and then we'd like to take you on a, on a short trip into our company, into SAP, uh, what we've done in terms of virtualization, what we've done in terms of cloud computing, what constraints we have um, in terms of our software, in terms of our data centers. But then, uh, most prominently, of course, we want to speak a lot about OpenStack. We want to talk about the project and, um, of course, how this whole OpenStack project integrated into our existing environment. So, thank you. Yeah, my name is Ralph Diener from B1 Systems. Uh, we are founded in the year 2004, so we have last month our 10th birthday. Um, we are specialized on Linux and open source. Uh, beginning, and at the beginning, we, we started with high availability and virtualization. And the last one and a half, two years, we do a lot of projects in the open stack area. <coughs> we have some partnerships. I think with the mostly leading solutions which are necessary in a data center. Uh, in this in this project. Uh, we use SUSE as uh, operating system, Puppet for the automatization, Nagios for the monitoring, um, and part-time Arista uh, as network devices. So, as Klaus Henning told you, we are not here to, to sell you anything, so we will not do a lot of marketing. Uh, anybody knows P1 systems already? No? A couple uh, of people uh, right there. So, <coughs> maybe most of you know SAP, and c in case you don't, so our company recently, two, three years ago, had our 40th anniversary. We are the leading provider in the world of ERP systems. We have um, a global, op globally operating organization. Um, we have hundreds of thousands of companies that run SAP, very mission critical business. 13 million users in hundreds of con in 120 com countries worldwide. I think what's more interesting is um, what we as the internal service provider of SAP actually do for SAP, for our development systems, for our customers. So in total, we have more than 70,000 70, servers, um, out of which we have about 50,000 virtual machines on 2,500 hosts. Um, in case you might know, I didn't update this slide, so these numbers are from 2012. Um, as you can imagine, these numbers continuously grow at a very, very high rate, so you could imagine that these numbers are a lot higher today. Um, back in 2012, 
we had more than 10 data centers worldwide. Um, as such, we are not only in Germany, but also in Europe, one of the biggest uh, data center operators. And um, with every acquisition we do, with every new product we ship, the number of data centers, the number of servers, the number of VMs keeps on growing and growing and growing. At the same time, um, this slide is actually from 2007. Um, I don't want to bother you with old slides, but I just want to show you that the uh, complexity within our internal landscape is very, very high. Um, we bring out a lot of new products, but at the same time, we also need to support our existing operations. Having said that, um, I'd like to um, explain to you a little bit how we try to manage this high level of complexity within our data center operations. So um, in our internal business and also the external business, we have um, around about four pillars that we segregate all our demand into. On the left side, we have what we refer to as volume business. This is a very generic, let's call it generic volume business. It's training and demo. Here we have a high turnover of systems, um, very short-lived, uh, high provisioning numbers. Um, but again, these are predefined landscapes. On the right side is what we refer to as the production business. Here we have, of course, our internal development systems. As a software company, this is the majority of our data center. But we also have business systems. And business systems is not only our internal SAP systems that we need to run our company, but these are all the external customer systems as well. So whatever you hear, for example, with HANA Enterprise Cloud or HANA um, Cloud Platform, um, hosting operations, um, cloud products, software as a service is all into the production business systems. What's very, very important in such a complex and, and growing, fast growing lands landscape is that you have a standardized data center infrastructure. So this is what we refer to as building blocks. Here we have a predefined set of building blocks where we try to optimize the hardware to the TCO uh, and the usage of an SAP system. As you can imagine, an SAP system, especially a HANA-based SAP system, is very memory hungry. Um, so one of the largest um, hardware that we have in the data center has six terabytes uh, per box and above. Um, I think the smallest uh, hardware that we have is 256 gigabyte of RAM. This kind of puts into the dimension um, the number of physical servers compared also to the number of, of VMs that we have. Next to the standardized data center infrastructure, which forms a uniform layer from the bottom, we have a uniform layer on the top, which is all the change management, automation, um, process design, workflow management. In idle terms, you would probably say in general service management on top, which manages all the different customers um, across all areas. This picture is very important for us to keep in mind because when we started with OpenStack two years ago, two and a, almost two and a half years ago, we had to somehow fit into that picture. And we'll come to that in a minute. Let's talk really quickly about virtualization and cloud, previous cloud projects we did, and then we go into OpenStack. So these are some of the projects we did um, from 2008 until 2012. Um, I don't want to go into a lot of detail on these. We had a lot of Gartner engagements. We had a lot of early cloud adoption. We, we have a lot of VMware in-house. We, we actually have a lot of Xen, KVM in-house, Hyper-V, Solaris, what have you. We have a very diverse environment. But in general, what we can say is that um, probably next to VMware, we have a very, very significant installed base of Xen. I don't know if these are 50-50, but these are the two most largest players. How did that journey start? So um, back in 2002, 2003, we at some point realized that our growth in the data centers that we have is so fast in terms of server growth that we will reach a cap in the year 2008, 2007. So this is the maximum capacity in the data center. And we said, if we continue to grow this way, we need to build a new data center. We need to wire new electricity. We find a new location, maybe a new country, new operations teams. And you need a lot of lead time to do that. So at some point, we said, how about we start to virtualize to avert this effect of having to build a data center? And we started very early with virtualization already in 2003. 
Um, by the time in 2006, roundabout, 2007, we um, certified SAP also for, for virtualized platforms, and um, we went into a volume growth. Um, this is roundabout when we started to virtualize, uh, to, to standardize all the virtual building blocks that I showed you before in terms of the hardware, and at the same time brought in a standardized change management from the top. Today, um, we have around about 70%, more than two-thirds of all of our servers virtualized. Um, I, th I personally think there's a certain cap within a data center. Probably you will never reach 100%, and probably for, for some workloads, it's good that you don't reach 100%, because, for example, if you run large HANA and memory databases in a productive environment, you want to keep that physical. But, but that's just a side remark, so we believe that around about at 70 80%, we are already in a saturation mode where we don't want to grow much further. As I said before, um, we have this building that, that we run in, in, in our data center, and I want to spend just one second talking about the bottom part, about the standardized building blocks. Um, it's a small picture of, of one of our cloud um, data centers on the top right, very fancy in blue. I think the marketing department went there and put installed some blue lights. <laughs> Typically, these are off. <laughs> um, the bottom part is more interesting. Um, so, uh, for example, in our VMware environment, we run um, clusters of 16 servers, 15 productive, one spare. So we have 16 servers. Um, each server today um, in, the no in the newest building block has three terabytes of RAM. And as you can imagine, you can put a lot of virtual machines on these servers. Um, our average virtual machine is around 40 gigabyte per virtual machine, 30 to 40 gigabyte. So we typically have 80, 100, if not more, virtual machines on this environment. It's important to say this because we want to keep the same um, standardized infrastructure for all platforms. So we use the same for Hyper-V, for VMware, and for Xen. And this was kind of the starting point for us, um, how we, we moved into OpenStack. We had a given set of constraints from the bottom with the hardware, with the way that our networks are set up, with the VLANs, with, with everything that came from the bottom from the data center, but we also had a fixed set of change management and service management that we had to integrate in, into the top. And this is our, our change management. We have a cloud lifecycle management, um, which is kind of a, a, a workflow that end users or um, self-service portals um, can, can request uh, virtual machines from. These can be SAP products on the top left, such as LVM, NetWeaver LVM, in case you use that product in your own data center to deploy SAP systems, and through an API, uh, through the IT service management portal, um, they can request their VMs, and these are built automatically into the right cost center, and so on, and so on. So for us, it was important when we introduced OpenStack that we had to somehow integrate into existing data center processes at that point. Um, on the bottom, as I said, we have a CMDB, asset management. We had a certain set of data center constraints that were given. Um, we have an installed base of VMware. We had an installed base of Solaris. And here we wanted to um, productize Xen even more. So this was kind of our starting point for the OpenStack project. In the very early days, um, how did we manage Xen? So um, when, we, when we first tested Xen, a lot of it was script-based, so there was not really a, a clear management framework on top. Um, we had a console front-end where you could easily request a VM, start, stop, and so on. And um, we wanted to take this existing Xen infrastructure and integrate it into all the existing change management processes that you saw on the earlier slide. So our target was for Xen to build a private cloud, um, to integrate it into the internal IT systems, into monitoring, reporting, APIs, and so on. Um, we um, decided from an early point on that, um, open from an early OpenStack point on, that we want to use OpenStack. Um, I think we did our first Proof of concept with Baxter. Baxter was we did our first kind of pre production use case on Cactus. Uh, we were very proud when we got to um, 
uh, see uh, the event you had in San we had in San Francisco in 2012, I think it was, the second mm -hmm. OpenStack event, and we, we saw there's a lot of traction on the market for OpenStack, a lot of people jumping on that train because we are doing really something good. And as I said before, we also decided, well, let's go on this OpenStack route, let's use it for Xen, let's try it internally, and let's see how we can productize this. And um, we started um, together with our partners on a, on a workshop. Uh, you can see some screenshots, some pictures we took from our whiteboards, because we, we kind of keep it as a reference, uh, what we discussed at that point. As I said, we, had a, we have a global data center operations. We have at that point, we had 10 locations worldwide that we needed to hook up. So we thought, how can we use OpenStack in an environment which is so diverse, but has a standardized hardware? We came up with a certain CMDB data model, integration interfaces. We saw the need for certain custom developments, which I will explain later on. And of course, we need high availability and somehow load balancing. So um, we came up with an OpenStack architecture for us. Um, this is probably not too far away from any other OpenStack architecture that you will see. Um, what was important for us is that we build in um, some low-level high availability into it. You can see on, on the top everywhere it says LB with a star. These are just simple load balancers. And this was the first kind of high availability concept that we had. Maybe what's important for us, which is come out SAP specific, uh, we had to make Nova Compute and Nova Network um, in such a way scalable that we can actually use it for such big hosts, also in a performing performant matter. The second point is that from the way that we uh, run our business, we have two NFS storages attached to each host. We, we don't use local uh, file systems, we only use NFS. Um, we, we do a lot of live migrations, we need a lot of flexibility on, on, on lifecycle management on the, on the hardware, so we needed to be able to shift VMs easily from one node to another node. So we came up with this concept, and this required some custom developments into the standard OpenStack. Um, so what were these uh, custom developments? Um, I want to go through these very quickly. Um, VM persistence is important for us because many times, um, as SAP customers, as our internal and external SAP customers, we need to uh, have VM persistence to start, stop, reboot VMs. Um, as far as I remember, by default, OpenStack, when you reboot or when you delete a VM, at least in the early days, I think they got deleted. So there, was was no there was no reboot. <laughs> or there was no um, the second point was we needed some kind of network range extension. We have a very diverse network er, um, within SAP. Um, we need to extend networks. We needed to be able to extend IP ranges. And um, also the way that we manage our networks is um, not a greenfield approach. Um, it's, it, it's an environment that has been running for a couple of, a couple of decades. So um, we, we, we had to do some custom developments on the way we manage networks in OpenStack. Data store load balancing I talked about. This was the two NFS storages that we have attached to each host. Next to that, um, live migration to be able to easily shift VMs from one place to another. Uh, along with uh, live migration, um, we have a very simple button in our um, Horizon dashboard which says evacuate host to evacuate it so we can do hardware maintenance, um, firmware upgrades, and all of this good stuff. Um, Dashboards is not really uh, something that's an OpenStack um, custom development, but dashboards is something we additionally install on the hosts to be able to collect uh, monitoring information, uh, performance, um, so that we can run overbooking uh, in, in a different fashion. I have some screenshots later on which I'd like to show to you. Um, VM resizing somehow goes along with VM persistence, so many times our internal or external customers will come up with a sizing of hardware and then all of a sudden they realize, hmm, I need more RAM or I need less, I need more CPUs. Uh, so there's a constant struggle to somehow resize these VMs and that's something we build in into OpenStack as well. Um, we have a, um, let me see if I, if I have a picture of this. We have a certain um, set of hardware. This is just a snapshot from early 2014, how we run our infrastructure. These are just by numbers, all the hosts. Um, and we have certain uh, what we call live migration zones. This is on the top. You will see LMZ01, 02, 03, and so on. That means that within these live migration zones, the CPU types are the same, 
the NFS storages are somehow compatible and you can live migrate between the hosts easily. What happens, however, if one live migration zone is full or for whatever, for whatever reason you need to migrate a VM into a different data center or into a different network? So here we need some kind of offline migration functionality, and that's something we as well built into the product. So this is the offline migration between availability zones. And uh, host evacuation we talked about. Well, as a result, at some point, we, I think after three months, yeah, two and a half, fast, very fast. it was actually quite fast, we were quite astonished, and we had more time that we thought we needed, but we had a, a running open stack, uh, we were very proud, and then we flipped the switch, literally flipped the switch, and uh, I remember in the very first four hours there was a kind of run, somehow everybody had been waiting to use OpenStack. <laughs> And uh, within four hours, there were 200 VMs on there, and, and we were actually quite astonished. Uh, I think in the beginning we said, for we went live, I, I remember this, this was the 2nd of April, it was not the 1st of April. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we, uh, I think it was some Easter weekend or something, and um, I remember the developer called me and he said, um, we thought we need 16 hosts for the whole year, but actually the 16 will probably be full in the next two weeks can we reorder hosts? And I said, well, I have to speak with my manager to order new hosts. So within the rest of the year, we actually went uh, very quickly to 120 hosts where we thought the whole year demand would only be 16. So somehow a great success. Um, in the very beginning, we did not have three terabyte hosts. We had um, 512 gigabyte hosts. Now we are, uh, the newest generation is uh, three terabyte. Um, and maybe in the very beginning, especially, but even today, we have an automation rate of 100.0% point down, no failures. And this is, of course, a great success rate, especially in such a complex landscape. As I said before, high acceptance from the customers. Um, there was a, to our benefit, there was a large migration project happening um, side by side. Um, <coughs> I think some company um, starting with an O, um, Oracle, which is a competitor to SAP. Um, I, I, th I think at that point they bought Solaris and there was some discussion internally to use Solaris or not, and then some developers decided to try out Xen and move away from the, I don't know, long story short, there was a certain uh, commotion um, also within internal development groups where they said, hey, you know, let's, let's try a different infrastructure, let's try OpenStack, and this was of course an opportunity for us as well. Um, to um, to show what OpenStack can do and 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 how well it performs. As I said before, we we um, have a an installed base of hardware. Um, I I saw some talks yesterday where they said, "Wow, we have 100 hosts. We have 150 hosts." Um, by now, we are we are looking more towards 400 and. We are talking minimum 512 gigabyte hosts, more towards, I think on average we have 1.1 terabyte right now. Um, the newest generation will have three terabytes. Um, as you can imagine, SAP applications are super memory hungry, so we need a lot of RAM that we are pushing in. Um, and I'll come to that in a second, what implication that also has for us as an IT operator to try to optimize costs further, because we need to work with our customers to really find the correct sizing for RAM. Um, this is our infrastructure that we have today. A couple of hosts are missing, um, especially our, our new um, ice house is not uh, really on here yet. Um, so this is what we have um, today on Folsom. We um, started first productive usage with ESSEC. We did an um, upgrade to Folsom, running rock solid. And now we are starting to prepare for an upgrade to ice house, but I think we, we still have some internal discussions whether we really want to use ISOs or, because Juno was released, you know, move right into Juno immediately. Supposedly, upgradability is better now, so I, I still have to do some discussions internally. Um, on the very right side, you see um, VSC on the top right. Um, we will talk about that later on. These are virtual system clusters. This is our new HA concept that we have. So we've adapted that continuously as we gain more knowledge into the infrastructure. Um, talking a lot. Um, you have to interrupt me, by the way, otherwise this is going to go on. 
<laughs> Go ahead. Uh, you talked about, uh, about uh, the, the memory, the RAM, and, uh, and uh, what about the cores? Isn't it the first yes. bottleneck? Yes. Um, that's a good question. So the question was, um, I talk a lot about memory. What about the CPU? Good point. Um, compared to other uh, customers um, or, or to, let's call it, standard web hosting scenarios, um, the number of, of, uh, of cores does, does not play the, the first bottleneck in an SAP environment, especially on such a large scale. Um, for us, we noticed that many times it's more the memory that we run into bottlenecks very quickly um, and less the CPU. So you can even say that on average, we are five to six times less CPU core hungry as a standard web hoster. So, um, first of all, I'm not a technician, I'm a program manager, but if I can rephrase your question, um, we have, uh, first of all, uh, we do CPU overbooking heavily, <coughs> as you can imagine. Um, so, our newest generation of hosts have 15 cores per socket, um, four sockets, so we have a total of 60 physical cores on the main board. And again, I'm not a technician, um, I'm just trying to get from memory what I know. We have hyper-threading enabled, so we already overbook by a factor of two. So we have 120 somehow physical cores available. The virtual CPUs that we provision to the customers, we limit to 480. So we have a factor of four in an over-provisioning. If you would count hyper-threading as an over-provisioning of factor two, we actually have over-provisioning of factor eight. Um, on some internal scenarios, we go into an over-provisioning factor of 12. W with all pros and cons. You talk about the hardware vendor, which vendor are you using? Uh, we're not specific to any vendor. W we have a, a lot of vendors in-house. Th there's a lot of HP, there's a lot of IBM, there's a lot of Dell, Fujitsu, uh, everything. You give us hardware at the best price, we take it. <laughs> but remember the memory. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, some of the stepping stones we took and some of the, what do you say in English, um, Stolpersteine, some of the problems we faced. Um, first of all, uh, we had some problems uh, with big tenants on Nova. So um, some of our tenants have two, three, four thousand VMs and the performance, especially for an administrator view, gets very slow at some point in time. Um, we um, had a, a certain problem for partitioned images, um, sparse images, thin provisioned images, um, but maybe these were more related to, to the hypervisor and less to the actual management on top. Um, network configuration is a, is a tricky topic because um, typically, as I said, we, we don't like to use DHCP. We, we need to have a, a static IP configuration so the systems can talk to each other. Um, so we had to find some way to actually, on a first boot, provision an IP address using DHCP, but then have a script that changes this to a static configuration. Um, VM persistence, we talked about um, support of bridge network devices in Nova. Uh, good point. I don't know who put that on my slide, but there was probably something around that. Um, <laughs> I have to talk to <laughs> the guys later on. Um, problems with DHCP lease time. Um, of course, DHCP, um, this is one of the first um, problems we had at, at some point. DHCP is the single point of failure. If DHCP, for example, the service goes down or the, or the host which runs the service goes down on, I think at that point it was on Neutron, um, then after 3,600 seconds or whatever, you know, VMs are starting to lose their IP lease time and this was of course a huge problem. So we tackled that problem actually uh, twofold. First of all, um, on a first instance, we have a local persistency on the VM um, that uh, the first run script takes the IP address it has and saves it on the local machine. So even if the central DHCP service is not available, the VM still knows its IP address. On a second point, we actually changed the IP address into a static configuration and made sure that OpenStack will only grant this VM the same IP address. So we have a, a tiered approach to solving the DHCP problem. Um, I'm not sure, but I think under quantum or 
the, the next product, it's uh, it's, it's already, already it. fixed. It's already fixed. So, so the sync back, it's false. On, so yeah, false. On false. false on. Um, support for sparse images, CMD line pass through, and so on and so on. Um, but overall, I think the Folsom environment until today is running rock solid, and we had fortunately so little uh, that we ac that we had to do or not do with it that it's running well, and we can concentrate fully on on anything that r goes towards ISO or anything beyond that. Um, a lot of the things that we noticed, we were able to push upstream. You will notice later on that SAP, B1 are some of the top contributors. Um, even though the size of our project, maybe compared to other companies here in the room, is, is fairly small or considerably small, um, we are, I think, one of the top 10 contributors in the whole environment. In the Juno release. Especially no. in the Juno release. So, um, bringing into memory this picture really quickly, I want to um, uh, show you how we then integrated uh, OpenStack once it was running into the um, standard um, SAP change management. Um, of course, the most important service when you <laughs> create a new infrastructure is you need to create VMs. So create XenVM was for us the, the first and most important service that we brought live. Um, I, I, I had a very practical hands-on approach. I said, look, guys, give me the um, OpenStack API. Show me what attributes, uh, this is actually from our project plan, Show me exactly what attributes you need, and let's make sure that we receive these attributes from the change management system, and let's work backwards. So we took OpenStack, we took the API, we said, what attributes do we need, and we created a UI from that. Very easy, or rather, we adapted an existing UI. So um, here we have six attributes. The first two are user passwords, so that's simple, uh, and the first and the next four are then the ones which we, which we worked on. That's clear. Then what we did is we created a workflow around it. Of course, you cannot provision a naked OpenStack VM. You need to put this, you need to retrieve values, you need to create host names using a host name generator according to the convention that we have internally at SAP. You need to um, have an intelligent placement of, so of, of resources. You need to put it into, into certain resource pools, into certain availability zones. Then you need to register all of this in your DNS. You need to create CMDB entries. You need to create billing records. You need to you need to do a lot of stuff. You need to create users to to make OpenStack enterprise ready and use it actually within your company. So just deploying a VM, that's easy to do. But using a VM in an enterprise where you have 70, 100, 120,000 VMs, that's the tricky part, and that's why we had to create this. Um, workflow around that. And of course, satisfying the demands of the security department is, is a whole other story. So we, we had to create, actually before we give out any VM to internal or external customers, we patch it according to all uh, up-to-date patches. There's a whole CMDB model associated to um, using OpenStack um, that we run internally. But I think I don't want to bore you with uh, IT service management details. What's, what's most important is that next to create VM, we started deploying a lot of other uh, lifecycle services that you need to run an infrastructure. So here you have reboot, create users, add disks. Um, you, you can read the slide probably by yourself, start, stop. There's a lot of things you need to do to actually use OpenStack in, in, in such an environment then. So, once we had a considerable amount of VMs, the next question is, how do you manage that huge number of VMs? And here, we, um, together with the, with the operations teams, we then thought, how can we then further optimize that, from also from a TCO perspective, how can we further optimize? So, and also, how can we guarantee customer performance if you overbook CPUs so heavily, if you use so much memory, and, and where's the best TCO for SAP? So what we did is, on the top right, you will see we created a dashboard. Um, I'm a business major, so my interest is always bring down TCO and, and meet the timelines. So my biggest worry was we have a lot of guys requesting 192 gigabyte VMs. Do they really need 192 gigabytes? And when we actually looked into these, um, I said, can't we create like a small script that retrieves the values, how much memory is deployed, but how much memory is actually being used 
Also the same with the CPUs. Can we somehow measure the CPU performance to make sure, also on a hypervisor and on a VM perspective, that these guys have enough performance? So what we did, what you will see here, this is a very simple thing what we did. We have a lot of collect D agents. Um, we, we measure the load. We, we measure, I think, 27 or 30 values continuously. We aggregate them in a dashboard, and, and we push all of this into a dashboard. For me, the most important part is the top right. You will see what is my configured RAM, what's free, and over the course of 30, 90, and 120 days, what's the maximum and the average RAM usage? And this is for me an important point, because sometimes an SAP system can be configured with 192 gigs of RAM, which it never uses, but when once you do a quarter end closing, you need these 192 gig RAM. So you need to measure these values over a longer period of time. Let me tell you, there are only a very few customers which actually really oversize their VMs. Um, even, even with the very even with the VMs which have a lot of RAM, which never use them, sometimes you will see very sharp peaks when they really need this memory, and then it goes down again. And this is exactly what we can measure with this dashboard. What, what we, as a team, do once in a while, we click on what's the maximum RAM usage, what's the maximum free RAM, over the course of 30, 90, 180 days, and we target those customers specifically and say, look, why don't you resize or let us overbook the RAM in a different way. So this is a very valuable information for us. At the same time, what we do, for example, this bottom part here, is a smoke ping. Um, smoke ping, we continuously measure latency, um, um, packet loss, um, all sorts of stuff to really make sure that customers have the best performance, CPU performance, and so on and so forth. Um, and this dashboard is also available for the customers. Yes, I That's didn't mention that. It's a self-service. So customers can actually themselves look internal customers, so internal yeah. departments, because we are delivering our services internally to other departments, not end customers on the market, let's say it that way. Yeah, but I think from a technical perspective, yes. you can even say more to that. Good. Any questions at the moment? Well, that's good. So, uh, as Klaus Henning already told you, we don't use only OpenStack, we use also some other open source solutions. Um, here you can see uh, the, the logos on the right side. The first important thing was our virtual system cluster with, with IceHouse. We now have implement, Im implemented the infrastructure components uh, in a high available uh, mode. So uh, all the management services run in the virtual machines, and these virtual machines are high available uh, based on a, base on a pacemaker uh, virtual system cluster. So that means if a host goes down, this is a three-node uh, cluster solution. If one of the hosts goes down or a service uh, goes down, pacemaker automatically uh, restart uh, the virtual machine on another node. And so uh, we have the infrastructure components high available. In the Folsom release, in the Folsom environment, we don't have high availability I think this we, are level. We, are, we are starting to upgrade the environment into that direction, but uh, for ISOs we are really going to use it yes. productively from the first moment on. High availability for the virtual machine, for the instances by self, uh, we don't have at the moment, only for the infrastructure components. Yeah, uh, we use Logstash for central uh, log collection. Do you know Logstash? <coughs> so each, each of the uh, multi-hundred of hosts, all the uh, logs uh, we collect uh, on a central server, and so we can use a different, or we can do different uh, Auswertungen, uh, um, um, reporting. reportings, and so we we can go into the path, uh, every information is what interesting, uh, we can check there. Yes, uh, for automation, we use Puppet, so that means if we get a new host, uh, the new host is fully automated, installed uh, with, an, with Puppet, and so we can grow the OpenStack environment very fast. Everybody, I think, knows Puppet. Puppet and OpenStack is often used in this combination. Yes, and for the, for the monitoring by self, we use a regular Nagios. Uh, we don't have a full Nagios environment. We use only the parts which are interesting for us, uh, and uh, with the dashboard, uh, we see the main informations which are interesting for us. 
So, what is next slide? Good. Yeah, uh, the virtual system cluster already described. Um, Puppet based centralized management. Uh, I think everybody understands it. Uh, now, with the ice house, we use also the similar volume service. In the Folsom, uh, we use the local uh, storage. Now, with ice house, we use uh, similar volume. Um, uh, what is, I think, is there anything? Yeah, all the standard features that come along with ice house. <coughs> yeah, as, uh, some of our custom devs uh, was, was, was fixed. So not necessary any more time. Uh, and at the moment, we have the ice house environment parallel. Uh, at the moment, we think and plan of how we migrate from Folsom to ice house. So uh, a rolling upgrade is not possible or not so easy. Uh, we have different uh, ways how we can do the migration from Folsom to ice house, or uh, perhaps we go directly to Juno. Um, but I think. Next year, we can tell you how we migrated from, from Folsom to, to ISIS or Chudo. Um, let's come down. So, so. Um, what we have now implemented in the ISIS environment, uh, because uh, I think you know it more better than we, uh, some new features which are really, really interesting for the enterprise uh, for ent environments. Uh, this CPU pinning is an SIP uh, special request, I think it was. Yeah, uh, actually, I, I can, if you want, I can say uh, two words to that. Um, we, we have a, a, a department, um, a, a performance measurement department, which measures, continuously measures the performance of SAP systems um, coming from development. And what they've requested from us is to not do CPU overbooking, so so that they can measure really measure the performance on exactly the same hardware. So for them, specifically for this department, we created a new tenant with a new availability zone, with a new live migration zone um, that has hardware uh, which we don't overbook in terms of CPUs. So we use a one-to-one -one core and vCPU ratio. Um, and no other customers are allowed on this environment, just to make sure that um, uh, there's no disturbance on the network, on, on file servers, on and so on and so forth. So this is uh, especially for our SAP uh, uh performance. performance. This is part of our quality gate process of the QGP department. And, and I think the go live was just uh, last week on, on Tuesday or on Wednesday. Good. So, yeah, I told you already, um, <coughs> upgrade to Juno. Oh, this is decision is already done, uh, mate. Oh, okay. I, I just put that on here so <laughs> we don't forget. <laughs> I'm gonna um, we will go, uh, now we have an, a good working infrastructure as a service uh, platform. And now we will go also to, to, to offer more um, platform as a service for this uh, we will use heat. Everybody knows heat, I think. So we can go also into the VMs and do some uh, configurations automatically. Uh, and this is also one of the features which we will use in the future. Um, I think about the uh, migration problem uh, we talked already. So at the moment, we're not sure how we do it. We have two sif uh, different ways how we can bring the virtual machines from Folsom to Ice House, but uh, at the moment, there is no decision. Good. Before we move into the next slide, what's um, really uh, let me let me give one sentence. Sorry. What's what's really important is that we don't use OpenStack for every Xen host in at SAP. We have, uh, I would even say, more um, currently still more Xen hosts outside of OpenStack than inside of OpenStack. And what's very important is that from a from a company perspective, these are um, existing infrastructures that have existed even before um, OpenStack as itself existed. So these are, if you want to call it more platform as a service, um, used as platform as a service. So therefore, right now we've, we've kind of rolled up uh, OpenStack bottom up. We've um, collected a lot of internal demand, which is pure infrastructure as a service. And here we positioned OpenStack very, very well. As you saw earlier on the press release, 
SAP has also committed itself to OpenStack. So what's happening right now, and, I, and I, there's absolutely no announcement I want to make, but it's, it's clear from the press release that you can see is that SAP is moving more and more into OpenStack and also into a platform as a service. So what you will most likely see over the course of the next months is that OpenStack will most probably be used more and more internally and also for customer deployments that go towards platform as a service. And here you will have a multifold of the volume that we have today just for the pure infrastructure as a service. This is something that is, is happening right now, so there's a sh certain uh, shift where new OpenStack installations are emerging um, that probably even go beyond the scope of, of, of our pure um, IT operations um, that go more into the development organization. Um, so here we are starting also SAP internally to go more into a, let's call it OpenStack DevOps, where we use OpenStack within platform as a service and IT operations. Go ahead. So if you're not using orchestration now, <coughs> have you also pretty well standardized the VMs that are running on your current Fulcrum OpenStack cloud in addition to the hardware underneath Fulcrum? Or, or do you permit your internal clients a significant amount of choice in provisioning those VMs? So our um, end customers today. Um, our end customers today go through a standardized portal the, that you saw earlier with the workflow. So here they have really a GUI where they can click with their mouse what kind of VM they want to have. Um, but these are pure infrastructure as a service. Uh, this is a pure infrastructure as a service portal. So you can say, do I want a VM with Windows? Do I want one with Linux? How much? How many CPUs do I want to have? How many? How many uh, hard drives do I want to have? Um, uh, it up as a it's not going to set no. it up as a Tomcat. Only the operating exactly. system. Correct. Got Pure it. infrastructure as a service. But, but that is the shift that we're moving into. Um, so internally, there's uh, another area side by side to us which uses Chef for that purpose. Uh, we have a couple of other um, SAP tools which have been used very prominently um, also in the past for the last um, eight, nine years. Um, what we're trying, this is more an internal IT strategy, what we're trying to do really is get all the au different automation platforms, all the different um, workflow automation platforms, run books, collect them into one more, one uni into a more unified stack, and here OpenStack is gonna play a significant role. Uh, with the time, uh, we are over. As uh, I said, it's us against your lunch. We're gonna keep on going if you don't stop us. Any <laughs> questions at the moment? <laughs> Sorry? What is the percentage of open stack you have today in terms of the entire virtualization, virtualization? Um, Let me do a quick math. It's, um, it is, we had a go live two years ago, so by now it is around about 8 to 10%. You're helping us. You can come on stage just next because that's the next part we're going to talk about. Um, but I'll let you go first very quickly, uh, and then I'm going to um, answer your question. Uh, yes, uh, the, we build up uh, we build the, the OpenStack environment. We do all the, the support for this. Uh, uh, the, 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 the f how much people we need, uh, I think four to six people are necessary for the operation from the full OpenStack uh, environment. Um, so I can answer that question very easily. We have a level one team in India, uh, which is a se shared service team. This has 20 people, but this shared service team uh, runs, I think, five or six different clouds internally. Uh, you can say on average we have about one and a half people in that shared service team, uh, 24 by 7, that run only Xen. Um, in addition to that, we have a 24 by 7 on-call duty um, uh, with our implementation partner, and here, eight by five, people are on site, and the rest of the time, we have an on-call duty and escalation path um, where support can be gathered. In addition to the level three team, we have a, 
I don't know if you want to call it a level four, level five team, um, which is more on the development organization. As I said, the move into platform as a service. Uh, and here, uh, SAP specific workflows. Um, how do I put that? So the level one, uh, level two, and level three teams do um, everything from the hardware into Xen into OpenStack. Um, because OpenStack integrates so tightly at some point into Xen and, and Libvirt and, and whatever you have technically, you need to have one team that manages both. But when it comes to OpenStack and the SAP application and, and the way that SAP uses the hardware, um, you need more uh, development and blueprint centric team. And here we have super specialists, experts that have all the deepest knowledge between SAP, how they use the hardware, what provisioning workflows, because they are the ones that also run, uh, develop the platform as a service. Um, what's important to note is that B1 as a company is both within the level three operations team, but also within the blueprint team. So there's a, there's a, they are on both parts. Architecture yeah. and also operations. Architecture and operations. Ich würde sagen, wir hätten da auch mal so Fragen und Antworten, oder? Kommt Any questions? Ja, wir kommen jetzt. Go ahead. Yes, so uh, that, that's a good question. So when, when we... Re hmm? uh, repeat the question, I'm um, sorry. Um, for the people in the audience, uh, the question is, do we grant um, our customers access to Horizon directly? So the answer is, is yes and no. It depends on how you define customer. Um, so for us as an internal IT department, our immediate next customer is another internal department. So um, right now for the pure infrastructure as a service stack, yes, we are starting to grant access into, into Horizon directly. Um, for the platform as a service, probably this will be integrated in a, into another SAP provisioning tool. Hmm. Do you consider a managed service for delivering the whole open stack experience, or is running this, learning this, really core to SAP? Th thank you. That's a very good question. So, um, and there's a lot of internal debates on that. Would I? Would we consider as SAP running an open? stack environment as a managed service contract, or would we want to have this knowledge in-house? So the answer is both. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that um, because um, nowadays infrastructure as a service is becoming more and more commodity. And that's actually why we're doing OpenStack, right? We're trying to somehow find an alternative to public infrastructure as a service, such as Amazon, such as others. Um, but at the same time, you're trying to safeguard your knowledge in-house. Um, so what, what we do is both. Um, we have a level one organization. We have an implementation partner that's the expert on OpenStack, on Xen, on Linux, and that's who I'm presenting with. And, and we're very proud to co-present this together. But at the same time, once the infrastructure is set up, we bring the knowledge in-house into our level one, level two organization, and we have a managed service for L3 and the continuous development of OpenStack. At the same time, we push that knowledge into the level four, level five organization, which at that point again is SAP internal, and these are our internal development departments. So the knowledge is somehow, where we really have a managed service contract, it's just for, it's not just, it's actually, from an OpenStack perspective, the most significant part. It's the OpenStack development and it's the OpenStack operations. Um, and here we have a very well functioning partnership and as a result, a very well functioning managed service contract. And we do, the, we do all the training for the first and second level so that they can do every time more processes can be covered by them. Yeah. I, I don't know who was first. I'm, I'm going to go with the right side to <laughs> switch sides. So the question is if we're going to uh, plan to have all the virtualized um, workloads on OpenStack in the future. Um, I don't know yet. We have a very, very large um, VMware installed base. Um, from a strategic perspective, we're positioning OpenStack in such a way that um, VMware is, um, OpenStack is going to manage the whole stack, but this is probably going to take a lot of years to um, evolve. Are you flying the open text 
So uh, the question is, we're very IOPS hungry, uh, whether we're utilizing the OpenStack IOPS or whether we, we're, we're using our own. So um, first of all, again, I'm, I'm not the architect. I'm not the architect. I'm, I'm happy to put you in touch with uh, the, the Blueprint team, um, which are actually here in the room. So um <laughs> uh, w that's definitely an answer that we can give you quickly, but um, right now, at least for the infrastructure as a service stack, we're using plain NFS. We're, we're, we're hooking that up to whatever EMC or, or NetApp that we have in the data center. I love that question. It's my favorite. It's my favorite question because I have the um, I, ha I have the uh, I do all the TCO calculations for that specifically, and uh, yeah, that, that's exactly my my, my target. Um, I, I did a TCO analysis. Um, the last update was about 12 months ago, um, and if you consider um, if you consider a workload which runs 24 by 7 for one month then um, internally you're about a factor eight cheaper than non-negotiated cheapest external prices. Um, however, if you have a workload that runs eight by five um, and maybe for two weeks in a month, um, you're, you're gonna see a, a, a break even at, at some point. Um, our biggest problem as an internal IT organization which I hear on every Gartner Summit I attend, um, is that many IT organizations, including ours, can only do billing on a monthly basis. We're a cost center, which means that we're, we're, we do cost recuperation, which means that we zero our balance sheets at the end of every month, which means that if we have a low utilization, then we still charge a whole month for a VM, even if you only use it for one hour. Now, that part is changing slowly. Um, but there's a lot of process adaption that you need to run internally. Um, from a company perspective as a whole, moving away from a per VM perspective, if you're able to deploy a VM for an hour and take it, take it back after an hour, then running it as an internal demand is a lot cheaper. Um, we, we did the economics. We, um, the, as every company, also we have at some point a run into public clouds such as Amazon where people start swiping credit cards and then reimburse themselves using travel expenses and all sorts of weird stuff that you have out there. Um, <laughs> so we're in the same boat as, as everyone else. Um, but if, if you try to get that under control and, it, and it's not really prohibiting saying you are not allowed to reimburse yourself using travel expenses, it's really finding an alternative that you can have internally. And how are you going to build that is a whole different question. So we started doing that by not building at all. We said, just have it for free. Anyway, that's a thousand times cheaper than pushing all the demand into Amazon, for example, or any other cloud. Um, so this was one of the projects of our CIO. Um, no charges, no billing. Just take the infrastructure you need, give it back as soon as possible. And then um, the usage of external cloud somehow went down very quickly. Any other questions? If not, um, just in case you're German speaking and um, you're interested in reading more about this, um, I, I did not give my input to this book. Uh, the guys wrote it themselves. I only wrote the foreword. Um, but a lot of the experiences that we made um, under um, the falls and releases and beyond that is in this book. You can order it on Amazon. The guys just released it, I don't know, a month ago. And um, it's an interesting read. And in case you still have additional questions, feel free to reach out to us. Good. Thank you very much. <laughs>